today's episode of the Six Ps podcast is going to be a bit of a cheat sheet. A quote bank, if you would, going through some of the key themes and providing you with quotations for that. Before we get started with this quotation bank, I should point out, of course, that um, these are just a couple of quotes that I've picked out and referred to each theme. It's definitely nowhere near a complete set of quotations for these themes and I definitely encourage you to go out there and find your own examples, find your own quotations, find your own symbols. And the reason I say that particularly is because last year in their examination report, um, VCAR noted that many students were picking up examples and ideas from study guides and basically regurgitating them. We of course know um, whatever examples we use and yeah, some of the examples you use of course are going to be in study guides but we don't want to simply Um, say exactly the same thing that's said in those study guides, we need to make sure we refer it to our own ideas and refer it particularly back to whatever essay prompt that we get. So let's start with the quotation bank and we're going to start with the settings. So in the crucible, we're looking at Salem, which is a barbaric frontier inhabited by a sect of uh, fanatics. We've got Dungatar on the other hand. Now, both these towns are what we call agricultural or agrarian. They rely on the land. They're also both patriarchal societies as well, where men have all the power, the power, particularly all the powerful and authoritative positions. Bit, bit of a difference, I guess, in the Crucible is it's a religious town. It is a town of Puritans. And these, of course, are individuals that fled persecution from England and went to what was known back then as the New World. In the Dressmaker, we know that football is an important side of the town. We have these really strict gender roles where women are more sociable and and they gossip a lot. Um, Marriage is to be expected and it's a way for individuals to gain power, not just for women. Of course, we know that Evan Pettyman married to gain power and money as well. And while it's strictly religious in the crucible, the dressmaker is a little bit religious, but it is more so what I would call a conservative rural community. So while religion is mentioned by a couple of characters, uh, particularly Mr. Almanac, it isn't embedded in religious doctrine like the crucible is or like Salem is. We've got a couple of quotations for the settings here. You'll notice that the setting in the dressmaker, we've got a lot of sort of geographic quotations, the visual quotation. So it's a dark blot shimmering at the edge of flatness. We've got a community hall in the middle. The fact that it wasn't a busy road, there are a few shops at its curb and that the town will be quiet again. The children will go back to the creek to play. The adults will wait for the football season and the cycle was familiar to Tilly and a map. It's a very cyclical town. Much like um, the grain that, and again, this is mentioned, of course, in that section where Tilly's talking about the grain and, and the sorghum. In the crucible, we've got these quotations to, to, I guess, describe the social codes and conventions. So the first one, until this strange crisis, he, being Paris like the rest of Salem, never conceived that the children were anything but thankful for being permitted to walk straight, eyes slightly lowered, arms at the sides, and mouths shut until bidden to speak. We love that quotation. We use that a fair bit. And the other one is, again, that belief that the Salem folk believe the virgin forest was the devil's last preserve. And the forest is an interesting uh, symbol as well in this text. We know the girls go there. They were dancing like heathen in, in, in the forest. We know that's where the Indian tribes come from, who marauded the, time from, marauded the town from time to time. And of course, we know that Tilly herself watched Indians smash her parents. Um, She mentions that when she tries to threaten the girls after um, they were caught in the forest, she says, I saw Indians smash my dear parents' heads on the pillows next to mine, and I've seen some reddish work done a night. Uh, That is, of course, on page 27. Let's look at vengeful communities. We have two societies here which are quite toxic we've got the crucible again we'll go to that quote a barbaric frontier inhabited by a sect of fanatics we've got this quotation from danforth who says we burn a hot fire here it melts down all concealment and the next quote that a person is either with this court or he must be counted against it there is no road or there be no road in between sort of highlights the toxic nature of the town and particularly those last two quotes about the court and the judicial system, which links in really nicely, I think, to the context and that what Miller is sort of trying to convey is he's almost trying to warn the audience um, against governments or judicial systems that are beyond reproach, a little bit like 
the American government in the 1950s. Um, we know, of course, that Miller, after the play, um, was questioned by Huack, and he uses this play as an allegory to sort of talk about what was happening at the time. The dressmaker, we also have this sort of vengeful nature of the individuals in the community. You know, you've got Pearl, Fred, Alvin, Muriel, Gertrude, Bueller, and Lois. Look at those names. And all the Sunday morning shoppers and country folk. So, again, using the word and, that they're connective to really build how many people are doing this. They watch the illegitimate girl push her mad mother, loose woman, and hang. We have these titles for Molly and Tilly. We also know, of course, when Tilly looks down on, on the town that... The oval, the football oval, that green eye is looking back at her. She's always being watched by the town, always being judged. Links in really well with Bueller as well, who ends up going blind, of course. The next quotation, in this town, a man can covet his neighbor's wife and not get hurt, but to speak the truth can earn a bleeding nose. That is Septimus Crescent who says that quotation. And it's a really good one, I think, to compare with the Crucible as well when we think about uh, the Ten Commandments and committing adultery or lechery uh, links in really well there. And the next quotes are really nice too, that everyone likes to have someone to hate and that they're all liars, sinners and hypocrites. Molly, of course, is the one that says that and that comes up just before Tilly and Teddy go to the ball. And the last one, I haven't mentioned all of it, but it's well worth a look. It's in the very last chapter after Tilly has burnt the town down. They groaned and rocked and bawled and howled. There's a lot more to that quotation than just that, but definitely one to look at when it comes to the punishment that the town receives for their vengeful and vindictive spiteful natures so again two really toxic and vengeful communities um the other thing to mention too with the crucible of course is we know before we know that of course the witch trials were used to bury grudges um but we also know that there was quite a litigious town before the witch trials as well that everyone was sort of suing everyone and even um, Giles Corey mentions how many times he's been in court. Um, it's a ridiculous amount of times. He, even Proctor, had been to court himself. So very, very important to know that as well. Slightly different now. We're going to look at insular communities. So please know the difference. Um, I also want to mention here with insular communities also conservative communities. So the first one from the Crucible, their creed forbade anything resembling a theatre or vain enjoyment and the fact that the balance is yet to be struck between order and freedom, and that long-held hatreds of neighbours could now be openly expressed, and vengeance taken despite the Bible's charitable injunctions. The opening commentary from Arthur Miller, those first four or five pages, are rich with examples that describe not just the setting of Salem itself, but a little bit about um, the religious aspect, and I guess the social and cultural aspects of the town too. This last one particularly links in religion quite nicely, and the idea of the court being this really Christian place. And we know the hypocrisy involved with these religious characters like Paris, who are meant to be you know, charitable, yet are quite greedy. On the other hand, we've got the dressmaker, where there's not a lot of change seen in this town. Um, the first one, the Prudence Dim had taught the children of Dungata for as long as anyone could remember. There's this real lack of progress in this town. They're quite restricted in their views and insular in their ways. It's also seen and symbolised through um, Reginald Blood's continual discussion on, on trains and diesel trains that are coming in. The next one, the quotation I mentioned before, the green eye of the oval looked back up at Tilly, the cars around its edge like lashes. A really nice simile to use. Um, and again, this is these are uh, language devices you can look to analyse in your essay. The next one that Mona giggled at the sex word. And the last one, it's Shakespeare. You, you've heard of him, haven't you? She may not have, said Mona. I hadn't until last week. Um, again, they're really not a well-educated town. We see that particularly, that gulf in terms of, you know, worldly views with Teddy and, and Tilly as, as Tilly keeps quoting Shakespeare to him and he just doesn't quite get it. We also see it, or it's reflected as well in, of course, William and Gertrude and the sonnet that he says to her. Um, so again, this idea that of having to leave Dungatard to become educated, which is what William and Tilly do. The next thing we're going to look at is blame and guilt. So for the crucible, John Proctor's uh, introduction through an authorial interjection. He's a sinner, a sinner not only against the moral fashion of the time, but against his own vision of decent conduct. And the next one. Let none be your judge. This is from Elizabeth. There be no higher judge under heaven than Proctor. I never knew such goodness 
in the world. I'd like to reference, it probably comes up a little bit later on, but Elizabeth Proctor as well, blaming herself for John's lechery. The next one, she, being Tilly, knew it was a mistake. It was too soon and too bold, and a feverish nausea swamped her guilt, and she said to herself that it wasn't her fault. There's this continual reference, particularly when Tilly first arrives back in Dungatar, about you know the knot in her stomach and that I guess that physical feeling of guilt. It's not just that emotional feeling, but physical as well. And it comes up in the next quote as well, that she pressed the guilt down again until it churned in her stomach. She was used to it, used to forgetting and enjoying herself and suddenly remembering and suddenly feeling unworthy. And the last one, of course, that comes up after she's shut out of the footballer's ball. It's guilt and the evil inside me. I carry it around with me, in me all the time. It's like a black thing, a weight. It makes itself invisible, then creeps back when I feel safest. That boy is dead and there's more. There's a really nice connection between characters who blame themselves in both texts for incidents um, where they had no control over, they weren't responsible for. Tilly and Elizabeth are really good to compare in that way, but think as well about how these individuals are blamed or they blame themselves, but also the guilt that they feel um, for the consequences of this. Um, and it's good to look at, at particularly about these characters, but in a sense as well, you can look at John Proctor too, who feels extremely guilty for what he you know, denotes as being um, the one sin that he has committed. Let's look at truth and deception. So in the Crucible, Abigail Williams's uh, stage directions, she's introduced through stage directions with having an endless capacity for dissembling. She also says to John Proctor that she never knew what pretense Salem was. I never knew the long lessons I was taught by these, all these Christian women and their covenants of men, the hypocrisy that she sees in Salem. The next one, when she's being questioned or trying to get out of being questioned, when she says that Tichuba made her laugh during prayer, she says that she sends her spirit on me in church. She makes me laugh at prayer. And Paris buys into it and says she's often laughed at prayer, looking for something, anything to explain something that Rebecca Nurse puts down to their silly seasons. Again, from Danforth, who says it is the entire contention of the state, the voice of heaven speaks through these children. It is the authority figures who have been deceived, who, and this is something that you should think about as well, about what evidence they accept and what evidence they don't. Um, and we see Hale traverse this line here a little bit. He sort of crosses the fence in the end. And then the last one from Proctor, the fact they're all marvellous pretenders, and they are. And you can look at that, the bird, as a symbol of that, of something that is invisible, um, which reflects there in the invisible nature of witchcraft. In the dressmaker, I think, you know, deception is looked at really well through fashion. We know the haute couture fashion is used to hide flaws, yet these are only physical flaws of the women of Dungatar. It's no mistake that Ham describes her dresses at the footballers dance in great detail and what Tilly has done for them. And just moments later, they shut her out. So Tilly goes to lengths to hide their physical flaws, but it's their in inner hatred that, that comes out not long after. The first quotation here is about Elspeth. She wore as ever a navy linen day dress and her fox fur, and that fox fur had bald patches on the mottled thinning pelt. She tries to give off this sense of, you know, um, class and egalitarianism, but she wears the same thing all the time and her nice fox fur is actually molting. The next quotation is about this Dungata or Dungata social club. She noted the members of the newly formed Dungata social club had acquired an accent overnight and enunciated Dungata interpretation of queenly English, again, trying to deceive themselves. And the last one, the man who was Evan, wasn't very successful at anything, but told everyone he was. Again, think about the facade that individuals put on to the world and how that's received by authority figures and I guess by the towns in general as well. Gender roles. I've only got a couple of quotations for this. This is definitely one you can look at in, in more depth. Even thinking about the, the term that women are called by as goody in the crucible um, is something significant that you can, you can analyze. Um, just the stage direction from Betty. She calls out hysterically and with great relief, I saw. And we see the repetition of this phrasing, I saw, I saw, I saw, to build the hysteria, a word that is predominantly used to describe women's reactions. 
And the last quotation for the crucible, which I mentioned previously from Elizabeth Proctor, where she says it needs a cold wife to prompt lechery. She sort of blames herself. It's definitely um, worthwhile looking at the way that um, women are subjugated by men and also, I guess, by other women as well, but particularly by men in both texts. In The Dressmaker, these gender roles which link into the social codes and conventions, that mothers could shop and gossip and men stood in clumps talking about the weather and looking to the sky and the thin-skinned, thick-boned women, which I like. They've been mentioned physically as being thick-boned quite a few times. Um, and the idea that they can dish it, but they can't take it. Uh, Sergeant Farrett talks about a good mule's load is always large. I really like this quotation. It's interesting. He sort of describes Gertrude as being um, quite a valuable asset to society. A woman who can work, who knows, who has really good knowledge. Reflects that 1950s, I guess, the growing independence that, that women had in the 1950s in, in the Western world following World War II. We know that they played a significant role working in factories, during the war in Australia and America. And um, following the war, they, they weren't looking to, to go back to their roles in a domestic sense. They had this freedom. They had this financial freedom as well as this social freedom. And Gertrude, I think, is a really good character to look at because initially in, in the text, we see her as this and then she sort of, you know, ends up becoming that um, banal house, housewife who is all about herself, really. The next quote the women of Dungatar dressed astonishingly well. Um, the outside looks looks at that when she comes to town. Um, they'd been European touched, you know, almost avant-garde is the other quote you, you can look at. And the next one, the last one, you know perfectly well that girls who wear dresses like that don't warrant honourable intentions. Molly says that. A hint of the conservative world that Dungatar is. Let's have a look at fear. And for me, the word fear comes up quite a lot in the crucible or even the term frightened in the stage directions we know that tichuba is referenced in those stage directions as being frightened because you know trouble in this house eventually lands on 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 her back and it's no mistake that at the very end of that act it is her who is blamed um, elizabeth says with great fear that i will fear nothing on page 72 a bit of irony there and rebecca says to john let you fear nothing that another judgment awaits us all we know the girls act out because of their fear of punishment, but we know the fear of death um, doesn't halt Rebecca and in the end it doesn't halt John from sacrificing their lives. In The Dressmaker, we talk about fear, the knot in the pit of Timmy Tilly's stomach hardened, the fact that William says to himself, he has self-doubts. He says, I will make a life worth living here and then self-doubt engulfed him. The next one, the people bobbed together like chooks pecking at vegetable scraps, turning occasionally to glance up at the house on the hill before turning hurriedly away, their fear of Molly and Tilly up on the hill. And the last one, and again, there's a lot more of this quotation you can reference, but Tilly says, I can start now. There's nothing to be afraid of. She's no longer fearful um, of the townspeople and she gets her revenge on them in the end. Let's have a little look at, at conflict now. The idea of conflict and a crisis was quite prominent in the previous pairings of the Crucible and Year of Wonders. Not so much here, but there's still conflict to be seen within the town. The first one comes from Rebecca Nurse in Act 1 when she says, This will set us arguing again in the society and we thought to have peace this year. I think we ought to rely on the doctor and good prayer. And the next one, the result of the conflict, which is the fact there are orphans wandering from house to house, that there are abandoned cattle bellow on the high roads, and the stink of rotting crops is everywhere. This society has imploded. And we know, of course, that the power of theocracy in Massachusetts was broken. That comes up in the epilogue at the end of the text. With the dressmaker, Elizabeth took to her bed and refused to have anything to do with the wedding plans. Her and Gertrude do not get along. It's a bit of a weird relationship between those two. Elizabeth sort of tries to use Gertrude and obviously her parents to get rid of their debt. It doesn't really work for her. Uh, we say that in the next quotation. There is the matter of your outstanding account, Mrs. Beaumont. The next one, the citizens looked increasingly stressed and tired and didn't seem to be enjoying themselves at all. Again, the implosion in The Dressmaker um, really, or the play Macbeth, the production they put on in Macbeth is the catalyst for that that ends up imploding. And the last one, at least I have a preference for men, some sick people in this town. And that again comes up towards the end after the production when 
there's a feud between everyone. Let's have a look at, at, at love now. I think with love, you can look at those two love stories of John Proctor and Elizabeth compared to Tilly and Teddy. You know, one, we see the rebuilding of their loving relationship. The other one, we see them building love and trust between them. In the crucible, these quotations all come up at the end. I would have your forgiveness, Elizabeth. These stage directions, he has lifted her and kisses her now with a great passion. This quotation links in really well with Act 2 at the very start on page 52, when we first introduced them in their domestic setting in their house. And the stage direction here says that John gets up, goes to Elizabeth and kisses her. She receives it, but with a certain disappointment, he returns to the table. There's not a lot of, lot of love and warmth between them when we first meet them together, but by the end, the stage direction suggests that, that, again, they've got this deep, passionate love for each other. And the last quote from Elizabeth, that he has his goodness now. God forbid I take that from him. In The Dressmaker, it's amazing what a little bit of nourishment will do. Tilly says this to Sergeant Farrett, making him feel guilty. Um, we've got that symbol of the Ongapurunga rug, that really Australian rug um, as well, that symbolizes that, that love. He was her good friend and he was her ally, Teddy and Tilly. The fact that Tilly provides... Teddy provides Teddy with, with acceptance. After Teddy's death, Sergeant Farrett knew that he had to step forward and embrace his flock. He feels this responsibility to the town as well. It's well worth reading his sermon. I like the word sermon as well. It's got religious connotations and it links in quite well with, with the crucible. And the last quote, the love between Tilly and Molly, that Tilly held her mother's hand until it was no longer warm. There's a really nice moment between the mother and daughter at the very end of the text as well. And it links in a little bit with the crucible because... John Proctor acts, in essence, um, for his reputation, but his son's reputation as well, and the idea of parents and their children and how that relationship works and what lengths parents will go to to protect their children. And the last one is power, particularly, in this case, the abuse of power. From the crucible, you will confess yourself or I'll take you out and whip you to death, Tichuba. This is something that many individuals faced, either confess to something they didn't commit or be killed. The hypocrisy of the situation. Paris came in for 20 weeks. He preached nothing but golden candlesticks until he had them. Again, Paris is a very self-interested and greedy man. He's driven by this, and that's all he really cares about. Even at the start, all he cares about is his reputation and being driven out from his pulpit. This quote about Thomas Putnam, this man is killing his neighbours for their land. He profits off the crisis in Salem and Danforth. There will be no postponement. Postponement now speaks flandering on my part. Danforth has a lot of great quotations in Act 4 that suggest that he is quite stoic, quite stubborn in the way that he dresses the law. He doesn't want to admit that he's wrong. He even says on that same page, page 113, that I should hang 10,000 that dare to rise up against the law. Later on on page 125, hang them, hang, hang them high over the town. Who weeps for these weeps for corruption. Think about his role, particularly being a judge and being a Christian reverend as well, and how he work, works with that. For the dressmaker, Mr. Almanac, her husband did not believe in drugs. All that's needed is God's forgiveness, a clean mind and a wholesome diet, plenty of red meat and well-cooked vegetables. This is a man who's the only pharmacist in town, whose wife is ill, but he refuses to give her me medication. Instead, he asks her to look to God for the answer hypocrisy right there. Miss Dim cuffed Myrtle over the head and dragged her from the room by her plait. The other kids leaned on the glass, windows laughing out loud. This is not just the kids who tease and bully Tilly. It's also the teachers and the adults as well. She can't escape it. They held her and gave her Chinese burns. Then they held her arms out and Stuart, Petty, Stuart ran at her, head down like a charging bull. So his head banged against her in the tummy. The boys pulled her pants down and poked at her, then smelled their fingers. This abuse that we see here of Tilly. And the last one, about Evan Pettyman. He was a man who touched women, leaned close to talk, licked his lips, and at dances pressed his partners tightly, ramming his thigh between their legs to move them around the floor. And we know that Evan not only abuses his wife, but other women in the town as well. So I'm going to hand it over to you now. Um, I think... It's really a good idea to build your own quotation bank 
the reason why is examiners might be looking at the same quotations over and over again and if you can have your own ones and your own unique interpretations it goes a long way to engaging them and showing to them that um, you're not just looking at the same old quotes again sometimes it's really necessary to use those um, clear-cut obvious ones but again we want to sort of showcase a wider knowledge and a broader knowledge of the text and the worlds of the, of the texts with these quotations maybe think about what ideas you might link them to so thinking about those detailed uh, ideas rather than the broader themes and please consider your next level in analysis in this so language features structural stylistic features the context symbols anything again where you can show off to the examiner that you're thinking about not just what is being told in the text but how it is being told as well that wraps up the unit for this semester. Uh, well done to all of you and good luck on your SACs and in your exam. I look forward to joining you over the holidays for some revision lectures, but until then, don't forget that proper prior preparation prevents poor performance.